Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We welcome our online family as well. Happy Sabbath. We are so happy that you're joining us this morning. We're going to continue uh, from last week the, the message of will a God of love destroy? There are many views about God, many understandings about God, everything from God as a Santa Claus to God as a tyrant, and he looks down on people and looks to see who he can destroy. Both incorrect, and we want to always go to God's word to understand what God wants for us to know about who he is. Everything that he wants for us to know in this lifetime is in this book. And so turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 145. We left off there last week. I posed the question, and, well, not really a question, just a statement. Um, the, the most known verse in the Bible, John 3.16, we tend to focus on the first part of that verse, and we forget the last part of that verse. And so today we're going to focus on the last part of that verse. We looked at God's love and all that God is in his love and how he deals with his people. For God the Father loved the world, everyone, every single person, so much that he gave Jesus. That whosoever puts their faith in him would not perish. The perish word is, gets forgotten. We don't hear about the perish word and what that means. And actually to truly understand that, you have to be willing and able to put down a current paradigm to get a bigger paradigm. And I'm telling you that because I've had to do that dozens of times. Coming from a Catholic faith and knowing absolutely zero about God, not even knowing what a Bible was, to the Lord calling me to preach his word, Many, 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 many paradigm changes. And a paradigm is just the way that we look at things, our view on things. And so we need to put it down, be willing to put it down and listen. Because you know what? If you just set it next to you, you can always pick it right back up. So I'm not asking you to toss it. I'm asking you to really allow the Lord to open up your minds because the Holy Spirit's job is to guide us into, into truth, into all truth. We looked at um, what God is and what love is. And our view of love is very skewed because we're, we're sinful human beings. You know, we love this, we love that. But God's love, what, what it means when we say that God is love, is that he has and he is the ability because he's righteous to balance mercy and justice perfectly. The perfect balance of mercy and justice. And that is great news for you and I today is that God is always perfectly merciful. He will give us all the mercy that you and I need, but he's also a just God. And he cannot be righteous without the justice part. It, it can't happen. Mercy and justice are the foundation of his throne because he is love. God created us for what reason? For relationship. That's why people get married, have children, to have a family, to have, be in a relationship. And so God created Adam and Eve. They started the human race for relationship. Prior to that, he created angel children. And so God is a God of relationship. And because he has made us for relationship and our purpose is to glorify him, he, it is his responsibility to make a way for us to hear from him and to know him. And we read from Romans 1 how God throughout the ages has made a way for people to know who he is, even if it was just in what he's, from what he has created. And I love Romans 1, that, that understanding that God reaches out to every person, that alone is what God used to compel me and why I fell in love with God, is because he's not just interested in one group of people. Not, we, we, are, we are fooling ourselves if we think he's only interested in Christians. He is interested in everyone. God loves the whole world. He loves everyone. And it is his desire to have us all in a relationship. The problem with that 
is that he's given us this gift called choice and we can choose not to respond to his love and not to respond to his wooing us into a relationship. Because it is God's job to woo us into a relationship, he's always also given us the ability to know right from wrong. We read that from Romans 2. Romans 2.14 is pivotal for me, a pivotal point in understanding that when he says even the Gentiles who don't have the law instinctively do the things required by the law, that doesn't just come from us. We are, we are incapable of that. Romans 8 says that in our carnal state, we are what? Hostile toward God. Hostile toward God's ways. So without the Holy Spirit, we go nowhere. Without the Holy Spirit, that's why wooing away the Holy Spirit, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, is the only unpardonable sin. We need the Holy Spirit. So he has made a way for us to know right from wrong. And Acts 10, 35, and 36, when Peter says, I now realize that God does not show favoritism, but he does what? Accepts men from all nations who fear him and do what is right. If we are willing to do what is right in response to what the Holy Spirit is saying, then God is pleased. Remember, he told Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So that is good news for you and I. God is not about head knowledge. Knowledge is wonderful for us to know magnificent things about God, but those things will absolutely amount to nothing if we are not walking in the Spirit. Just head knowledge will make us to be the type of people that Jesus met when he came to walk this planet. They were called Pharisees. They knew the rules. They knew facts about God. They knew scripture. They could quote it left and right. But God said, your worship is lip service. Your hearts are far from me. And so we, we're going to look at, you know, we looked at last week the lengths to which God goes to to communicate with us and to save us. God does everything possible, leaving no stone unturned for just one person. Remember how he goes after the one lost sheep? God will do anything for one person because he loves the person in Siberia that doesn't know him as much as he loves us. And that is a huge concept for us to really internalize because it is who God is. And we are going to spend eternity with people from all walks of life and with all labels. You know, we all give ourselves labels. We all, there's how many denominations are in Christianity. God's not interested in any of that. He's not interested in a label. He's interested in obedience. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. And whatever he is telling you, today it could be forgiveness. Today he could be saying, you need to let go of this, um, of this unforgiveness. And so if we refuse to do that, we're refusing the Holy Spirit. And so every day, your God, the one that you, you're here because you are professors of Jesus Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ, longing for his appearing. We talk about going home. We sing about going home. We talk about when is Jesus coming back to take us from this place. Who is this Jesus that we're going to spend eternity with? Because we've looked at the mercy side Today we're going to look at the justice side. And the only way to truly comprehend that is to go back to the beginning. So let's, we're going to, today we're going to go all the way from Genesis to Revelation. So put on your seatbelts. Genesis 2. Some of these things you may never have considered. And I marvel in that when we are willing to sit before the Lord in his word, he's always going to give us fresh bread. Always. No matter how many times I've read a passage, 10 times, 20 times, when I read it again, guess what? There's a freshness always that comes from God's word. It is who he is. God is never stale. We get stale. God is always fresh and, and inviting and wonderful. And I want, as we get started and we read um, Genesis 2, I want to just tell you that there are four eternal verities, four eternal truths that will exist forever. Number one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. James calls this the royal law. 
the Ten Commandments come under the royal law. The royal law is bigger than the Ten Commandments. So many more things come under the Ten Commandments. In fact, unforgiveness, even though it's not one of the top ten, comes under the royal law. And loving God, because he says forgive and being obedient, and then loving your neighbor. So just a small thing like that. Loving God and loving your neighbor. Number three is worship the Creator. Forever and ever throughout eternity, we will be worshiping the Creator. And in fact, those of you familiar with Revelation's story know that the first angel's message in Revelation 14 is worship the Creator, a call to worship, and a call to worship how God says to worship. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first four reveal love for God, and the other six reveal love for your neighbor. So number three is worship the Creator. Number four is sin equals death. The day you sin, you die. And number four is the least understood. And we're going to talk about that because it has to do with God's justice. And we're going to see that God told Adam that in uh, Genesis 2. Let's look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it into and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are to eat, free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when, your Bible must, may say, in the day, that same day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now that's God's command. And that command existed even before we get to this point. It, it existed for the angels. We'll talk about that in a minute. Now, God wasn't saying that the fruit of that tree was poison. The fruit wasn't poison. Defiance was poison. Disobedience equals defiance. That would poison them. And it, he wanted them to stay away from it. Now, understand that any time, when, when we are in a relationship with God... There are always going to be tests before us. Adam and Eve were perfect, right? No propensity towards sin, no attraction for wickedness. They were perfect. And God placed this command in front of them and said, the day that you eat, you will surely die. So let's look at verse, um, chapter 3. We'll look at what happened with that command. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You won't die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. One thing about Satan, he is an opportunist and he takes advantage of things not yet revealed. He takes advantage of the things that you and I don't know, can't see. I, when I imagine this um, scenario, I imagine the serpent holding a piece of fruit, maybe even taking a bite of it, and, and maybe even saying, look what it's done for me. I mean, none of the other animals in the garden talk. Look what it's done for me. Look what it can do for you. God's holding out on you. God told you not to eat from it because he knows what will happen to you if you get it. You will be like him. Well, just that little bit of doubt is what, what Satan does. Always just one seed of doubt in trusting God, she lost her trust, and she, she, she was no match for, for the serpent. He had plotted. He had waited for the perfect moment. He had caught her alone. She had let down her guard, and she ate the fruit. And then she takes the fruit to, to Adam. Well, who got the command? Adam got the command. Can you imagine what he thought when he saw her coming, offering the fruit? What did God said would happen to Eve or him if they ate the fruit? You would surely die. Was Eve dead? Eve was not dead. Wait a minute. The serpent 
was probably right. You will not surely die. Eve didn't die. And so Adam, not wanting to lose Eve, ate the fruit. At that moment, and I'm, I'm going to try to, I want to just try to encapsulate this because this is a huge, huge subject that really we need to have weeks t- to look at. But I want to just whet your appetite if this is new to you. At this point, two deaths became possible. The death that God is talking about, if you sin, you die, is the second death, the permanent death. The sin that came into play because of this, because Jesus was willing to die for Adam and Eve as a substitute in their place because they did not sin defiantly. Eve was tricked, and Adam, Adam's love for Eve, it overtook him. They did not plan. They were not defiant. And so salvation was offered to them. And so God put something into play, a second death that you and I know is sleep, because it's a pause button. It's a, only a pause button. I want you to think about sleep as a pause button. It's temporary. The first death is temporary. The second death is permanent, gone forever. Um, when people die, they sleep. So he told Adam and Eve, let's look at verse 19, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return from the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Were Adam and Eve immortal beings? No. To be immortal means you have life within yourself. Who is immortal? God is immortal. He has life within himself. He can create life. You and I were not are not created to have immortality. So that's why God said, you were made from dust, you're going to return to the ground. You're going to have an ending point. Beginning point, ending point. You and I, we all have a beginning point and an ending point. As we wait for Jesus to come, if we, anything can happen to us, some people are going to be standing to see Jesus coming in the clouds. All the rest of us, there, there may be a grave waiting for us. Because unless Jesus comes, we will all have a grave with our name on it. Yes or no? Yes. Has anyone here been living forever since Adam and Eve? No. We don't have the right to live forever on this planet. And God made a plan, understanding that sin would come into the world. And this is one of the grandest things that I love about God, is that he saw the mess that was going to come from us, from creating human beings, and he chose to create and to love, and to plan because of what he was going to get on the other end, because of the harvest that would come. Isn't that amazing? You and I don't think like that. If you and I know that this thing's going to happen as a result of this, we'll just stay away from it. We just won't go there. God saw the horrible, detesting things that sin would bring, and he still created. And this plan is perfect when you understand it. It is amazing, and it is holy and righteous, and it is so good. And so God made a plan that people would have to sleep while they wait for him to come, to redeem them and to make all things new again. And one of the neat things is, is that after Jesus died and he paid the price for sin, Jesus says in Revelation 117, I was dead, and now I am alive, and I hold the keys to death and the grave. Death and the grave are in my hand now. And he says in John 5, 28 and 29, that in the future, those who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Why? Because that's where they are. They are sleeping in the dust of the earth. And I love also in John 6, 40 says, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let's look at that last day. Let's go to the book of Daniel. Whether you understand or not, there is a plan underway as we sit here today for Jesus to redeem his sheep. Today, we are one day closer to that day. 
the coming of Jesus, Jesus is not just going to pop out of the sky. I wish that was possible, but it's not. Because the book of Daniel tells us things that have to happen before Jesus comes. The book of Revelation fills in the details. Daniel and Revelation go together perfectly. An incredible love story in this book. Daniel was given all of this information. It was, whoa, too much for him. And he says, um, let's look at verse, we're in uh, chapter 12 of Daniel. And he says, how long, at the end of verse 6, how long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? He just wants to know this. And then in verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? This is too much. I don't understand it. It's too great. And he's told in verse 9, go your way, Daniel, because the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified and made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Okay, now that right there is a whole month worth of study. That's not what I want you to be pondering. It's number tw verse 12. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. As for you, go your way. In other words, prepare to go to a grave. Go your way till the end. You will rest, sleep in the dust of the earth. And then at the end of the days, what days did he just talk about? The 1,335 days. At the end of these 1,335 days, you, Daniel will arise to receive your allotted inheritance. Wow. God is telling him right there, I am going to take you to heaven. Don't worry. Don't worry about all this stuff. I am pleased with you. You are going with me to heaven. On day 1335, I will be here. Whoa. How awesome is that? So you and I are waiting for day 1335. We know that Jesus is coming on that day. What we don't know is what? Where is day one? Where is day one? God has planned a sequence of events to prepare and announce his coming. Do you know why God has prepared a sequence of events? Love. Love. To give everyone an opportunity to get on board and to be saved. That is our God. Mercy, 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 mercy. Time, time, time. Anyone that is not in the kingdom, there's only one reason. They did not want to be there. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. Refused. Because of that grand gift of choice that we were given. They refused to love the truth and so be saved. And so I... Um, before we leave this, I want you to re look up at verse 2 because we're told that there's going to be distress like never before during this time. Jesus warns us at that time there's going to be tribulation like has never been since the creation of the world. Get ready for it. And he says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Where are the, where are the dead? Asleep in the dust of the earth. We all like to sleep. When we get tired, we like to sleep, and we fall asleep at night, and we wake up in the morning, and we have no clue what happened in all that time. Okay, as we get older, we might not sleep the whole night, but you know what I mean. You go to sleep, you wake up. And that's, it's so merciful. It's so perfect. It's so amazing what God has done to put, press the pause button of our lives as we await for his return. And during this time, what Jesus is doing is judging to see who is going to, who has, who has listened to the Holy Spirit and who has not. But I want you to see this while we're here because it's right there. Some are going to rise to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And when we apply this verse to Revelation 20, we understand that there's two resurrections. And we'll talk about that in a minute when we get there. So, the first death is temporary and the second death is permanent. That is the mercy side of love. 
is that God has given and will do anything that he can to save every child because everything that God does is motivated from love. He loves. He's not selfish. He's not arbitrary. He does not show favoritism. He loves every one of us. And this is what I love about God. I love this about God. So now we're going to do a turnaround and we're going to go and we're going to investigate God's justice. So in order to do that, let's go to the book of Leviticus chapter 24. God's love demands justice. When God says, this is what I require, then we respond in obedience or defiance. And eventually there will be a price to pay. When he was forming up the Israelites to be a royal priesthood, to be ambassadors for his great name, he gave them the, his requirements. And then he said in 2417, if anyone takes the life of a human being, he must be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution for life. I want you to remember that word restitution. It is forgotten today. It is simply forgotten. Life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor, whatever he has done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has injured the other, so he is to be injured. And most of you are familiar with the golden rule from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, yes? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Okay, this is the reciprocal. You find it here. You find it in Obadiah 115, which says, As you have done unto others, it will be done unto you. Your sins will return upon your own head. This is why you and I need a Savior. We don't want our sins upon our own head. We can't pay for our sins. We can't stop from sinning. Even if just in our own brain through bad attitudes... And selfishness, it's there. And so God gives the plumb line for our lives. And he does everything that he can to bring us into repentance. Go back to Leviticus 18. I want to establish a few things before I take you to the book of Revelation because it's a barn burner. All right, um, Leviticus 18. I want for you to understand that from throughout the ages, as, as God was merciful with Adam and Eve, and as he was so uh, fair with Cain and Abel, and remember what he told Cain when Cain was so angry and jealous at his brother, he said, Cain, why are you having this attitude? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Sin is crouching at your door, it desires to master you, you must master it. So this has been what God's telling us all the time. Do you hear God telling you that? I hear him saying, Letty, why are you having this bad attitude? Why are you thinking this? This is not okay. God is communicating with his children all the time. So he's dealing with us on an individual basis, and he's dealing with us on a corporate basis. So throughout time, as, as people's numbers grew and there were nations of people, God gave every nation so much time to get it right, to love him and obey him and enjoy the fruits of that, of, of that life. Just like he told the Israelites, choose life. If you do this, this is what you get. If you do this, this is what you get. God gave us a choice and that big two-letter word, if, is always there. God's um, kingdom is based on if you will be my people, then I will be your God. He doesn't impose being our God on us if we don't want him. If you will be my people, then I will be your God. If you draw near to me, then I will draw near to you. Of course, we don't start that process. We could never start the process. God woos us to that. We would never go seeking after God on our own. Never, never, never. God seeks us. And then he tries to grow a relationship with us, and then we choose how it goes. So in 1824, when he tells the Israelites, do not defile yourselves, he lists all of the sexual immorality that's been going on, we know, 
since the beginning of time. He says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. This is what happened. This is why I drove them out. It wasn't because Israel was wonderful and grand. They were just like everybody else, and they proved to be just like everybody else. But God, in his mercy, out of his abundant love, he gives us opportunity to get it right, to line up with him, to walk with him, to enjoy a fruitful relationship with him. It's what he wants. It is what he desires. But corporately, when a nation became so defiled and would not listen to the Holy Spirit and mercy no longer had a redemptive effect, what else could God do but to cut them off? And so he says, oh, I've, I stopped in the middle of the sentence, because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land became defiled. So I will punish it for its sin and the land vomit out its inhabitants. God says, I am going to get rid of these people because they become corrupt. And this cycle happened over and over and over again. And I want you to understand, he's talking to Abraham. And he's telling him, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. But it's going to take a little while before we get there. Because the sin of this nation has not filled its full cup. I'll read, let me just uh, have you write it down in your, in your um, margin there. It's Genesis 15:16. When he says, your descendants will come back for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. God has a measure that he uses for each one of us individually and corporately. And once we fill that cup, then God deals with us. And an example of that is in Genesis 19. In Genesis 19, 23, remember the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? God told Abraham he's going to go down there and destroy it. And Abraham said, no, 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 Lord, don't do it. What if there's 50 people? What if there's 40? What if there's 30? What if there's 10? There was not 10. And so, I guess there were three that were willing to leave. I mean, you can't count Lot's wife because she, she turned and looked back. So she really belonged there. But God had to deal and cauterize the effects of and the disgust of sin here. So verse 23, By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah for the Lord out, from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in that land. There was nothing more that God could do. And because God doesn't force us, because God's given us the right to choose even to hate and defy him and to become totally corrupt as it was in the days of Noah and forward, then he has, he's responsible for cauterizing sin. So God has cauterized sin many, many times. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be here. God has had to deal with the sin problem, corporately speaking, for a long time. And because Jesus mediates on our behalf, the Father's wrath is not poured out on this planet. But that day is coming. And for those of you that long for the appearing of Jesus, get ready and know what's coming because it's going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. And if Jesus tells us that, we better pay attention. He says it's like nothing has happened, not the flood, not Sodom and Gomorrah, not anything else. Get ready. All right, let's make it into Second Peter chapter 2. And I know I'm going really fast because I really want to cover a lot of things. Um, if you have any questions about the death and judgment study, go to our website. I did an, an in-depth study there on PowerPoint that, is, that can fill in all the blanks. So Second Peter, we're going to look at this because the answer to will a God of love destroy is yes. I think you've already seen that. A God of love does destroy because love is just. Love is just. Love cannot allow wickedness to go on forever. Otherwise, God is not a righteous judge. He cannot tell us life for life 
eye for eye as the plumb line. He doesn't mean, you know, go out and pluck each other's eyes out. He's saying the plumb line is that just, you know, one equals one. I mean, one, the same. God always expects it to be the same. And plus restitution. We well, you know if we pay our bills late, we have to pay interest and penalties. We hate that, but it happens. Um, in paying God back for what we owe, it's not just the life for life, but it's restitution. And restitution can be anything from 20% to 400%. Remember Zacchaeus? When he made things right, he paid back four times everything he had stolen, so 400%. So depending on what the Holy Spirit says, that's, you know, restitution is what we owe. It's not just sorry. There are times that we have to make things right in other ways. So Peter, in Second Peter, let's go to uh, chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world when he bought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. I'm going to stop right there. In the days when he's writing this, the word hell is equal to the abyss. And that is where Satan and his angels are. In fact, when you look at Revelation 9, you see an angel that goes and unlocks the keys to the abyss and lets Satan come out. Revelation chapter 9. The abyss is actually the invisible world. Satan used to live in a visible world in heaven. He got cast down and he lives in an invisible world. Aren't you grateful for that today? We can't see him. Yeah. Or his evil angels. They live in the invisible world. God is not allowing them to be visible. But the book of Revelation tells us in chapter 9 of Revelation that he's going to be let out. And that's part of the end time story that we need to get into our heads because there's so much here. But I want you to note here that burnt, being burnt to ashes is an example of God's wrath and how he deals with sin. And God promised that he would never flood the earth again. So he will never use water for destruction. So he's going to use fire for destruction at the end of time. So right here, we'll be, you have a little paradigm adjustment in case you have never heard this. But hell is not a place. Hell is an event. It's not started yet. There's no purpose for it yet. Jesus is in the process of judging people. And so life, death has not been given to everyone yet. You and I are still alive. We're walking around making choices every day. And during the tribulation, God will have to judge not just those that are dead, but those that are living. Because while we're living, we can make choices for good and bad. And that's a whole other story. But I want you to understand that hell is an event that is coming for the purpose, for the purpose of dealing with sinners. It's God's... You read here that he burned Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. Malachi 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, tells us that the wicked will be ashes under the soles of our feet. Those, the best way that I can say this, that, that I understood it when I first heard it, that has made the most sense to me, is those that choose defiance are demon possessed there are many demon possessed people living right now you can't turn on the news without seeing that someone has taken a weapon and killed people for no reason that's demon possession it's predatory behavior those that do things like that have allowed a demon to enter them it, Satan is a predator and he inhabits those that allow him to just like if we allow the Holy Spirit he will inhabit us or we can allow a demon to inhabit us. We have that choice. We have one or the other. We read in First uh, John, the Third John last week, we're either children of God or children of the devil. That's that's sobering. I mean, sheep and goats, two sides. And so the purpose of hell is it is an incinerator for goats. That's what it is. Reduced to ashes. Because a righteous God will not take wicked people with him to heaven. 
And if I choose wickedness and I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit will not ever inhabit me. And so all that I can become is, is a place for demon possession. And God's never going to allow that to happen again. There will never be sin again. And so all that God can do is destroy. The perishing, let's, let's read that. Let's go over here to Second uh, Peter 3. Verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Don't you hear that today? Jesus isn't going to come. That's just a big fairy tale. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. You know, blah, blah, blah. The, ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget. Look at that word deliberate. It's a choice. That long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of God, ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise about coming back to take us home, as some understand slowness. He is patient, not wanting anyone to what? Not wanting anyone to perish. He doesn't want to destroy. Ezekiel 33, 11 says, I have no, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. No pleasure. God loves his children. Period. And it grieves him when we make detestable choices. But he tries always, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? If you and I are going to have a part of God's kingdom, we have learned the ways of repentance. We've learned to recognize sin in our life. We've learned to confess it. And we have asked God for forgiveness. He's forgiven us. And we live a life of repentance. It's ongoing. It's necessary because a, one living a life of repentance has chosen the ways of humility. Otherwise, pride rules us. I don't do anything wrong. I'm a lot better than other people. I mean, you know, we are, we're all here keeping the Sabbath, those poor people out there in the world. And yet, our minds are corrupt. So, you know, coming here. Because he asked us to rest on the Sabbath, we say, yes, Lord, of course, that's what we'll do. That's what you've asked us to do. The day, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed, how? By fire. And, and every, the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So, now that I have you in the mindset, it's taken me this long to get you there. Now we'll go to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 14. Understand that God is very patient. He seems to be silent right now. We have all kinds of detestable behavior on this planet. It's getting worse and worse. How is it that a minority of people has such a loud voice in today's world? Minorities of people, small groups of people dictating what, how we're supposed to live and how to defy God. We are in the last days. The fact that we now have the keys that unlock Daniel tell us that we are living in the last days. This is the time of the end. And if we do not get serious about our relationship with God and our submission and our, and our desire to live to be right with him, we are going to be devastated when God breaks the silence. The book of Revelation tells us the things that God is going to do prior to his second coming. And we can bury our head in the sand and say, I don't believe it. But guess what? What we believe has no bearing on, on what's going to happen. God never has asked us what he should do next. And the people in Noah's day, did they get on the boat? Eh, that is the craziest thing I've ever heard. That could possibly happen. As they're banging on the door for Noah to let them in. It was too late. 
So Jesus tells us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in, in the coming of the Son of Man. And we are there. And we can, as they did say, all these things aren't going to happen. Because really, when you read the book of Revelation, it's like some wacky sci-fi movie. It sounds crazy. And that's, you know why? Because God's dealing with crazy human beings. We are the crazy ones. And God has to go to extremes to get our attention. And he's going to do that. And we're either going to be horrified because the God that is in our mind was the Santa Claus genie that we conjure up whenever we need him. Or we're going to take a deep cleansing breath and understand why God has to do the things that he's going to do to wake up the world to make a decision. And so let's look in the, at the three angels' messages here. The first one is worship the creator. The second one is Babylon has fallen, meaning there's a crisis government that is going to arise out of the destruction that God brings on this planet. And God's... God is ahead of time what's going to happen if we take this mark. He says, um, verse 9, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Here again, burning sulfur. Burning sulfur from Sodom and Gomorrah. Peter saying, fire, 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 fire. Burning sulfur. Are you hearing what God is going to do to those who defy him? And he distinguishes those. Verse 12. All of this horrific stuff that's going to happen, this is what God is saying. This calls for patient endurance, endurance on the part of the saints. And who are the saints? Those who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. All right. So now, the end of the story. 